Welcome to the Advancing PAH Care video series. This series includes key opinion leaders who discuss new information in the 2022 ESC ERS treatment guidelines for pulmonary hypertension and how these recommendations can be incorporated into clinical practice in the U.S. Some of the topics to be covered in this series include risk stratification, the right heart beyond pressure, ESC ERS treatment algorithms, and individualized patient care. The focus of this video is to provide a high-level overview of the key changes in the 2022 PAH treatment guidelines with regard to PAH care and treatment. With support from UT, the PAH initiative provides non-branded disease education for the PAH community. The initiative worked with PAH experts to identify the content for this program. Welcome. My name is Dr. Jean Elwing, and I'm a professor of medicine and the director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Program at the University of Cincinnati. And I'm joined today by Dr. Scott Visavati. Scott, welcome. Thanks, Jean. I'm Scott Visavati. I'm an associate professor of medicine and the director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Program at The Ohio State University. I'm also a cardiologist. So Gene, let's give a bit of an overview on how these guidelines were developed. They were developed in Europe by a multidisciplinary group. Uh, you and I probably practice a bit differently here in the United States, as do many of the, uh, the practitioners who are listening into this video series. And so let's talk about some of those major themes that we'll, we'll hear about throughout the rest of this series. We now approach pulmonary arterial hypertension as a hemodynamic condition, and therefore it requires a hemodynamic definition. Uh, it's important to talk about how risk assessment at baseline and at follow-up is incorporated into uh, recommendations about treatment decisions. It's also critical to touch on the critical symbiosis between a local practitioner and a referral to a pH center and how this combination of, of, of expertise works in a patient's advantage. So Gene, the hemodynamic definition of pulmonary arterial hypertension has been debated for many, many years, including since the last World Symposium. What are your thoughts about the implication of this new definition? This is a very hotly debated topic. So as we remember, we define pulmonary arterial hypertension as a mean pulmonary pressure of 25 or greater with a wedge of 15 or less and that PVR greater than three. But we learn through big data sets that those individuals that had that mean pulmonary pressure in that what we used to call borderline range, 20 to 25, had increased risk of poor outcomes and mortality. And now when the group assessed the data in this new ERS ESC guidelines, they found that even those patients that had that lower mean pulmonary pressure, that greater than 20 pressure, if they had high resistance in their pulmonary vascular circuit, if it, even when it was over two, they had worse outcomes. So they proposed a new definition, but they didn't stop there. They also looked at exercise. And you know, we have been looking at exercise for so many years, trying to find really what we would use as a cutoff and they proposed a mean pulmonary pressure change over cardiac output slope of greater than three millimeters of mercury as an abnormal finding. So where are we gonna take that? I'm not sure yet, but we will need to be able to study that group of patients further, see how they do over time, and maybe determine if they would need treatment at some point. But currently, the only people we really recommend treatment in general to are people that meet the traditional, the older definition, because that's what we used in all of our clinical trials. You know that. So those other individuals with that lower mean pressure or the lower PBR, they are the people that really we want to see in expert centers. We want to evaluate. We want to see what the trajectory of their disease is and then understand when we need to offer treatment and when it's appropriate. So another area of the guidelines, which I want to ask you about, is risk assessment. So very important. And how are you incorporating that and how do you view that in light of the new guidelines? Never before has risk assessment been woven throughout the entirety of guidelines. Very, very important. Important to assess risk at baseline, which we've done. Equally important to reassess patients frequently, generally every three to six months, with risk reassessment at that time as well. Our goal being to drive risk to 
to the low risk category. And only with frequent reassessment is that possible. It risk also helps fuel our approach to treatment, escalation of therapy based on risk, critically important. So Jean, could you give us a, a, a brief overview of how risk assessment helps dictate treatment options in the new guidelines? So with our new guidelines, the 2022 ERS ESC guidelines, we're seeing patients, evaluating, diagnosing them based on our new hemodynamic definition, and then risk assessing. We wanna know severity of illness from the get-go. And those patients that are low or intermediate risk, we'll start them on two oral therapy. And those individuals who are on the high risk, we're going to treat them as aggressively as we possibly can with our oral therapies in addition to a parenteral prostacycline. But we're not gonna stop there. We're gonna reassess with the four strata model, as you mentioned, looking at walk distance, BNP, and functional class, and then see where they fall. Are they really getting to that low risk? And if we are, then we're happy. We're gonna hold tight. If we're in that low intermediate, we're either gonna change medications or add medications. And if we're anything high, high intermediate or high risk, we either need to progress increasing our parental prostacycline or add one. So really helpful in giving us a nice framework. Now, do we have to use this for risk strata? Of course not. We can use Reveal, we could use a French scoring system, but we have to do something. We are doing our patients an injustice if we don't reassess them. Scott, another area that the guidelines stress is collaborative care and expert centers. How do you apply that to what we're doing in the US? In Europe, and by and large, it's sort of a spoke and hub system where patients are evaluated locally, but then all referred to a major center uh, where expert opinion can be uh, leveraged and administered. Things are a little bit different, as you know, in the United States, where we have very good folks who are practicing pulmonary hypertension in, in local centers. There are huge benefits to having a patient evaluated at a PH center. Certainly, this takes into account how complex PAH is, not just the diagnosis, but we have more treatment options now than ever. Uh, and it's important to make sure we find the right fit for the right person. In other words, not every medication or every combination uh, approach is right for each individual. Jean, could you summarize some of the key takeaways of our discussion today? So we talked about how pulmonary arterial hypertension is ever evolving. Diagnosis and care has evolved. New medications, new, new risk assessment strategies, but the most important thing is that we continue to evolve and learn additional things, how to positively impact our patients. And really, we have to leverage, as you mentioned, the accredited expert centers and the local physicians and work together for best outcomes. So we've covered only a small bit of what was stressed in the guidelines, but some very important points. And we invite everyone to join for future videos about the new updates from the guidelines from 2022 ERS ESC. So Scott, thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure to talk with you about the guidelines. Thank you, Gina. I always learn something sitting with you, listening to you. Really appreciate your input. Thank you for watching. This program is part of a series of videos about how PAH management has evolved in recent years. Topics covered in this series include the importance of hemodynamics, the role of risk assessment, the PAH treatment algorithm, and considerations for the treatment of PAH. For more information on PAH, please visit resourcesforpah.com.